All right, welcome to the Jazz Piano School Podcast, episode number 226. This is going to be called How to Efficiently Practice Anything. In this particular podcast, I'm going to take a step back and go over a general practicing process, a general practicing process that's going to help you essentially tackle any part of your practice game that you want. Chords, scales, modes, improv, anything you want. I'm going to teach you how to efficiently practice and it's going to be absolutely amazing. This is the first time you're joining us and you want to get onto the live podcast recording list uh, to be in the live audience like I have right now as I'm recording this. Go to jazzpianoschool.com forward slash live podcast, jazzpianoschool.com forward slash live podcast and you'll be able to get notifications about when I go live and do these podcasts recording. Also, as, as well, definitely go to jazzpianoschool.com and check out all the free education that we have available for you. So with that being said, here we go. Now, usually at this point, I like to dive right into the piano, but with this particular topic, I really need to kind of take a step back and be more of a, a teacher. I need to go into a lecture hall moment right now. And for all the YouTube scanners out there who are, you know, just so eager to get to the piano, if you drop this video or you close out, you're going to miss some, some knowledge nuggets I'm about to drop in you right now. Okay. So please be patient because I'm going to get to the piano in a second, but I need to cover some really, really important and crucial steps. Here are the five steps that I'm going to go over in this practicing process. Number one, discipline. Okay. Number one, discipline. Number two, goals and assessment. Number two, goals and assessment. Number three, what to practice. Number four, the learning process. Okay. And number five, integration. I'll go over those one more time. Number one, discipline. Number two, goals and assessment. Number three, what to practice. Number four, the learning process. Number five, integration. All right, so number one, discipline. None of the other steps that I'm about to teach you are going to work unless you can exercise some sort of discipline, right? Some sort of discipline. So as a teacher, when I go to teach students, I don't usually, I don't teach too many live students anymore, but some of the groups that I do, uh, essentially I'll tell someone something or a student and ex I'll explain a concept. And immediately when the student goes back to the piano, they're doing the exact same thing that they were doing before. Have you guys experienced that? I mean, I have done it lots and lots and lots all throughout my career, all throughout my education. And it's hard. It's difficult because we need to show up to our practice environment with a mindset of discipline. Okay. How many times have you guys have sat down at the piano and you start practicing and then you kind of hear something, then you fiddle around with something else. And then by the time you know it, you're just playing all the stuff that you know how to play already right? That happens to us all the time. So here's what I recommend. I recommend you take 15 minutes, literally schedule 15 minutes into your practice time, maybe once a day, right? That's all it takes, maybe 10 minutes and say within that time, I'm going to discipline myself to focus and play and practice the things that I do not know, which are going to help me get better. Remember, anytime you're practicing things you don't know, that's when you're improving. When you're playing the things you do know, there is room for improvement, but for the most part, it's already stuff you know, right? That's a general rule of thumb. So you have to discipline yourself to not approach the piano as if you know what's coming, as if you know what's going to be taught. You need to approach the piano with discipline so that you can go slowly. You can take your time. You can focus on exactly what you need to learn because, again, 99% of the time when I'm teaching someone, there's different types of students and there's students who will listen to me and slow down and really listen to everything I'm saying and apply that knowledge. And those students make really, really quick progress in a short amount of time. And we all want that, right? That's what we all want. So the more you can discipline yourself to do that, the better you can be. There's also students who listen to me, but they're not really listening. And then they go back to kind of just doing whatever it is they were doing before, right? Discipline, number one. Step number two, goals and assessment. Goals and assessment. A lot of times, if people go, students go to play a tune. So if I were to go to play a tune, I'm just going to show you the keyboard. If I were to play a tune and I were to play this,
Now, if I get to this part here, and then I screw up, for example, right? This could be a lot of different things happening. That mistake can be a lot of different things, right? So it could be many, many different issues. And what you want to do is really assess what is happening in that moment, right? And this is where goals and assessment really kind of come into play. You need to understand what your goals are and then take a crucial assessment of what is not happening. What process, what system, what tool is not happening in your playing that's not allowing you to express what you want? Now, fortunately, unfortunately, a lot of students don't know, and that's why teachers are great. That's why jazz piano school is great, right? Because you can ask these questions, but even if you don't have access to a teacher, you can still do this manually on your own. So at the piano, I demonstrated something where I made a mistake. Now, this could be me not knowing that particular chord. Maybe I don't know how to play an E minor seven, right? I go to play a particular chord at that spot in the tune and I just don't know how to play it. It could be that I don't know how to voice it. I don't know how to voice the chord. It could be that I know how to voice the chord. I know how to play the chord, but in that particular moment, if I'm improvising or I'm playing a written lead sheet, it could be that my spontaneous improvisation movement of the chord is not happening. But if I'm playing the lead sheet, then that's just standard practice. That's like literally playing a classical sheet of music and getting to a spot and not hitting the right notes. That's also an issue as well. So there's many, many different issues that could come into play and you have to dissect on your own or if you have a teacher or some sort of guide, right? Guidance within an educational website like Jazz Piano School or even others with sites. Is it the chord? Do I know that chord? Do I know that line? Do I know how to improv over that particular type of harmony? Am I going too fast, right? What is the issue that's happening? And the more you can kind of dissect exactly where you are in the moment, in what's happening, right? I had someone a couple of weeks ago when I was doing a live stream say, well, in this particular piece, I always get to this one spot and I can't seem to play it correctly, right? And so I took a deep, uh, deeper dive into that. And this whole time she was just trying to play the tune, right? When in actuality, the problem was that she had never practiced her minor seven flat five chords, right? She didn't know her minor seven flat five chords. So you can't expect to play the tune if there's a chord in there that you don't know. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you keep practicing the tune over and over and over again, because that's not giving you the tools, right? The tune doesn't give you the tools. You need to practice the tools, put them in your tool bag, and then go back to the tune. And that's step number five of the practice process that I'm teaching you right? Integration. That's integration of the tools. So once you've assessed the problem, then you need to isolate the problem. I'll talk about this more in a second, but really focus in and understand that's the issue. So let's talk about goals and assessment now. So what are your goals, right? Let's say your goal was to play through a tune. There's many ways you can play through a tune. Let me go back to the piano here. I can play through a tune in a very, very standard way. Let's, let's, um, take, you know, um, um, night and day, as I was playing before. I could play it like this, just root position chords, okay, with the melody on top. Now, if you're a Jazz Piano School member, you would know that a lot of the solo piano arranging techniques I teach are going to move your shells to your left hand, or excuse me, your right hand underneath the melody and bass notes in your left hand. So instead of this, you would play this. You hear the difference there? That's a drastic difference within five seconds. This as opposed to this. Right? So if your goal is to get through the tune and practice, like playing it like this arrangement, that that is a specific goal in itself, right? If your goal is to improvise through the tune, that's another type of goal. Maybe you want to improvise.
so on and so forth. So there's many types of goals that a student can have, and, and it's not enough that a student actually really picks a goal that is very specific. All of us want to be able to play tunes and improvise, but having that particular goal isn't really going to help our practice session. It's not going to help our practicing. We don't really know what we want. We, like everyone wants to play jazz piano. They want to play all these different types of styles, but what, where do we even start at that point? We need to have specific goals in order to have specific practice sessions, okay? So you really have to narrow down exactly what it is you're working on. And this is why assessment is so important. So maybe you have a goal to improvise over two five ones. That's a great goal. This will drastically help narrow your practice session so you can understand the next upcoming steps I'm about to teach you, right? So you start with discipline. You pick your goal, you assess where you're at. Like maybe you're a bank beginner and your assessment is, you, you do a self-assessment. I don't really know, I know my minor chords. I know my major chords, but I don't know my dominant chords. That's your self-assessment. Well, your goal should be to learn your dominant chords because, right, there's lots of dominant chords in lead sheets. And ultimately, your main goal is to play tunes, right? So if you don't know your dominant chords, you're not going to be able to play tunes. And that, this type of assessment process is a very straightforward process, but unfortunately, just not a lot of students work through this because our brains are scattered and we just kind of, we just are just jumbled. We don't really have a system. We just kind of go at a bunch of different things. It's like throwing you know what at the wall and hoping something sticks. We go on YouTube, we watch all these different types of videos on random, random things all the time. And we expect to kind of just like get better magically. Unfortunately, I wish that's the way it worked, but it doesn't. And again, like maybe you just need your voicings. Like maybe you just need better voicings, right? And again, even with that category, there's many, many subcategories. All right. So goals and assessments is number two. Obviously very, very important. Number three. Okay. We're getting into the piano part here. For everyone that was patient and waited, congratulations. <laughs> So here we are. So let's say your goal, like I just said, is to learn your two five ones with with better voicing. So a better voicing besides root position chords would be inversions. These is like a this is a common voicing path that I'm going to be releasing later this year in jazz piano school. These different types of paths. So inversions, right, is a just a one step up from root position chords. Right now, if I go another step up from that, I can go to my rootless voicings. Right now, I'm using rootless voicings instead of inversions. Okay, and if I go one step up from that, I can start to throw in extensions. See that? So I th I added flat nine, flat thirteen here onto my voicing. If I go one step up from that, I can start to create two hand voicings at this point with left hand solo piano components in my arranging system. Now that was a humongous difference. Did you guys hear it? Let me revert back to the, the path, the step before. Here's rootless voicings with extensions. These, everything's happening here right now, just in my right hand. My left hand is just playing bass notes. Now check out the difference when I use my two hand voicing building process. Complete difference, right? <clears throat> so in step three, which is the step that we're on, you've done the assessment and you have a goal. Right? Your goal is to practice the next step up of your voicing. So let's say we're at the inversion point. Right? So you know your inversions. You can voice lead them through two five ones in any key. Okay? But now you want better voicings. Great, fantastic. You got your goal, you've done your assessment, you're in a disciplined state of mind. Step number three is what to practice. What to practice, right? Now, chords usually take on some sort of repetitive exercise. 
And again, what I like to do, I'm going to show you a system I use for chords here. I'm not going to go over all the things like improv and stuff like that, but I'll still, I'll still touch upon that a little bit for chords. Here's what I do. I do left hand alone, right? So if I was practicing my rootless voicings, for example, I'm going to do left hand alone. Okay. I'm going to do right hand alone. I'm going to do hands together. Now I'm not, I'm going to get into the learning process in a second. Okay. I'm just describing what to practice. Okay. I'm not actually showing you my practice method just yet. All right. I'm just telling you what would be the exercise. Uh, the fourth exercise would be bass note to left hand. Just like that. Because in solo piano, I'm going to need to grab that bass note. jump up whatever it is I'm playing right <clears throat> and the last one is going to be bass note to hands together all right so I'm going bass note hands together bass note hands together okay just like that now for a particular type of movement theory tool what I call them we'd be moving this through a theory process which a lot of you are probably aware of that I use in jazz piano school but uh, essentially what's happening here is that for chords that you just, these are like nouns in the, in the language. Like, it, you know, if you're learning French or Spanish, you just need to learn nouns. So <clears throat> let's say you want to say, um, you know, cat in French. You just have to learn the word cat in French. Le chat, le chat, excuse me. Or chien is dog right? Or I am in French is just sweet, right? Um, you know, s'il vous plaît, sorry. So it's the same in jazz. Like there's just some things you just need to learn. Chords and certain types of voicing movements that I teach, these processes, it's literally just like learning this stuff. It just takes time and repetition. All right. So once I go through this process again, left hand alone, Right hand alone, hands together. <clears throat> bass note to chord, bass note to chord. Bass note to two hands, two hands. Now there's many different ways you can do even this. Let's say you're just learning your minor, let's say you're learning one particular type of voicing. So if you're moving into a higher advanced level and you're, you're trying to apply, remember how I apply extensions to this? flat 13, flat nine. If you're learning, let's say you're, you're learning how to apply this particular, these two particular extensions in, I would use the same process. So I'm going to do this left hand alone. Okay. Then I'm going to switch keys. I'm going to go through all the keys. Or excuse me. I'm going to do, th I'm going to do all the steps that I just taught you, but through the keys. Okay. So I, then I would do right hand alone. Then I would do bass. I skip bass to left hand, but you get the picture. Okay. And then I'd go all through all the keys. You're going to need to use this for all the keys, right? So whatever key, you know, I would just, I would go the circle of fourth. So your new key would be F here, right? So then I would have this, 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 this. So on and so forth. Okay. So I know what to practice now. And then eventually we get into flashcards. Now there's, there comes a point when you're practicing scales, modes, chords, and, and the student is like, oh, this is so boring. I don't want to do this anymore. And like, I've been practicing these exercises for so long, but then I go and play a tune and I still can't seem to get it. <clears throat> Trust me, I get that. And <clears throat> the most important part, once you've learned something is the randomization of it in this third step. Okay. So what I'm still on step number three, what to practice, what to practice, right? So what exercise, when I say what to practice, I mean, what exercises are we practicing? Like to learn our goal, like we have our goal, we've done our assessment, but what do we practice to get better? 
chords is pretty easy. We just, like I said, it's just like learning nouns in a language. You just need to learn it in a lot of different ways. Now, once you've drilled it in a lot of different <clears throat> kind of ways like that, randomization is going to help you the most when we get to the inject, excuse me, the um, <clears throat> integration point of the chord. So to randomize things, what I highly recommend is flashcards. And, and in Jazz Piano School, we have flashcards in, in a computerized way where it flips and you have to kind of play it immediately. But if you just use index cards, you can do this really, really amazingly as well. So I have an index card. Let's say it says G7, uh, rootless voicing, flat nine, flat 13, which is the voicing I was just showing you. So if I pulled that card, I'd have to play that as quickly as possible. Now these cards, and again on the thing it's saying F minor seven, but there's no root there, okay? So I have my flat 13, flat nine in my shells to my G7, right? And then maybe my next card says, you know, um, F7, rootless voicing, flat nine, flat 13. Right? So I'm just pulling these flash cards and I'm just trying to get these voicings as quickly as possible. Now, it could be that you're practicing something more simple. Maybe you're practicing your drop two for your rootless voicing in your second structure. So here's my second structure, rootless voicing. Right, so I have my seven on the bottom, going to three of my G seven on the bottom, going to seven of my C major seven, right? Maybe you're practicing your drop two, so you're going. So your flashcards would be essentially you know, all the different types of two, five, ones in, in a key. So you would just write G on your flashcard. It would just say G. So let's say I pulled a G. I would immediately play a two, five, one in the key of G as fast as I could. And then I would just keep going, you know, that's all, that's all you would do. Now, this randomization is really the key to helping you learn things so that they can spontaneously come out. I'm gonna say this one more time because it's extremely, extremely important. This particular process with flashcards and the unknowing of what is coming, right? So in this particular, and it doesn't have to be flashcards, but it can be anything. So like, you just have to not know what's coming in your exercise before we get to the integration part where we're actually putting these things into a tune because you wanna practice the randomization where your brain does not know what's coming next. Now at that point where you can accomplish an exercise, where your brain doesn't know what's coming, you don't know what's coming, but you can still do it at a consistent tempo, that, that is what you're striving to get to, right? Because in that moment, you are spontaneously achieving your goal, right? And jazz is all about spontaneity, right? It's all about playing tunes and using different tools in a spontaneous motion, like right on the spot. But if you've never practiced that, when you get to the tune, what do you think is going to happen, right? You're going to crash and burn because you've never practiced the spontaneity part. The tune is the blueprint. It's not meant for, I mean, it is meant for practicing. I'm going to get there in a second. But the, the hard work, like the bulk of the practicing is not meant for the tune, okay? All right, we have to learn our tool first. We have to practice the spontaneity of it. And then we're going to inject it into the tune. All right, so that's step number three. I'm still on step number three here. Let's, let's review discipline, okay? Number two is goals and assessments. You have to understand and dissect what the issue is that you're having. Like, what is the issue? Really think about it. Like, what am I not able to do? And I know that's a tough one because you really need, you need a second pair of eyes. You need a teacher or you need some sort of process. You need to ask someone, right? But if you, you know, if you get to a certain level, like intermediate players should be able to do this on their own. Because you have a lot of knowledge, but there's some barrier that's blocking you, like mentally and, and, and on the piano, right? You got to step back for a moment, take a breath and be like, what is happening here? Like what, is, you know, it's like digging yourself out of hole in life when you get kind of tied up in things. All right. And, and number three is what to practice. Now, again, like I said, if you're, if you're having a sticking point with improv, knowing what to practice, that's difficult too, right? And so if you're trying to learn how to move through chords more or your improv doesn't sound good it's really hard as a student to know what's not working 
you know, but you're going to want to focus on your improv. And a lot of the time it has to do with theoretical knowledge about the chord and the movements. If I'm practicing my improv over two, five, one and my solo sounds like this. Right. Obviously that doesn't sound good. So what is the issue there? You know, well, there's a lot of different issues. We're at the, we're back at the assessment process, but you really have to dissect it and say, you know, okay, if you've been listening to my, go through my podcast. Okay. You're not hitting many chord tones. That's a big issue. You're not using the connecting mode tones to move as the glue for your code to chord tones. And that's really the most important aspect of what's happening there. Okay, so if I just use chord tones alone, already my solo is completely different than what I just played before because I was able to accurately assess the problem. Now, I, I totally skipped the practice stage there, but I'm just sh demonstrating. Step number four is going to be the learning process. This is really, really important. Very, very important. So humans by nature are, are, we're incredible, incredible machines and beings. We're in a consistent state of adaptation. Always, whether we know it or not, our body is adapting to the, the slightest temperature changes. Sleep, even 30 minutes of sleep. You know, have you ever gone to bed at like 30 minutes later or like gotten up 30 minutes earlier and you're like, I'm exhausted, right? It's so weird, but like our body is so infinitely in tune with the most nuanced details of our life you would never even imagine. But you have to remember this because when we go to practice something, the first time you play something, your body is learning it. I'm going to say that again. The first time you play something, your body is learning it. So again, let's say I wanted to learn my dominant bebop scale. Okay. So I teach a student the scale, right? And I teach them about the passing tone and they do two things. They, they remove the passing tone and they add in another note to their mixolydian scale. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. I, I got it. I got it. Then they try it again, right? And then they, maybe they get the passing tone but they still add the, the new note to the mixolydian scale. Wait, wait, no, no, I got it, I got it, hold on. Let me see, let me see. No, 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 okay, hold on. And by the time you know it, <laughs> their body is actually in their hand and their muscle memory, everything about their being is learning all the different mistakes that they've just played. Like all of them, your body is learning any time you play a mistake. And I know it's kind of dramatic, but this is the mindset you need to take when learning things because I guarantee if you have the discipline from step number one, you can shorten your practice time by like 100%, like 200%. Like you can learn things in literally like four minutes guaranteed rather than like hours. Okay, so what you want to do is the very first time you go to play something, do not play it until you know exactly how to play it right. I'm going to say this again. Listen closely. Anytime you go to play something, do not play it until you know you're going to play it right. <clears throat> but Brendan, it's so complicated and I need to try it out. I understand that. But this is part of the learning process. Just <laughs> go slowly. Just go slowly. Let me show you how slow I'm talking about. And this is not a fun thing, guys. This is not a fun thing, okay? This is like watching paint dry. But trust me, if you can discipline yourself to do this, it's going to help you infinitely. So let's say the student, or let's say me, let's say I'm practicing something. What? Let's say there's a really cool movement here. Let's say I want to learn that, okay? And this would be over like an F7 sus. It's a really cool line. Right? What did I play last? I think that's what I did. Let's say I want to learn that. Right? I made a mistake there. <laughs> so I need to go back and play it again without mistakes. So this is how slow I'm going to go. I'm going to go like super slow speed. 
And every note I play, I'm thinking to myself, okay, is that the note that I need to play? Yes, it is. And I'm going to go to my next chord. And again, before I play this note, I'm thinking to myself, is this the correct note? Yes, it is. Okay. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Is that correct? Yep. D correct? Yep. A correct? Yep. Okay. I'm going to do this a couple times so that my body learns the notes. It's learning correctly. It's not learning mistakes. It's actually learning the correct notes. This is step number four of my practice process, okay? This is the learning system. All right, so now my body has learned the notes, like physically, mentally, it's still not there though, technically, right? Because we haven't really sped up the tempo or anything. Right? But I am learning it. Okay, so what's the next step? We up the tempo slowly, slowly, right? And this is where a metronome is really useful. Because a metronome is going to do one of two things. It's going to put pressure on, first of all. Like even if even if you can play this without a metronome, like I just did. Putting a metronome on at a slower tempo is, is going to be harder than what I just did because of the pressure, right? Even if the metronome is clipping, clicking slower. So what I played right there was about this. But I guarantee if I put a metronome on slower and I went to go play that, I would feel pressure. I may have some hesitations and I may, you know, make a mistake. Click, click, click. Right? So practicing with a metronome and without a metronome are two completely different things. That's also another very valid point that you should be aware of, be conscious of, right? Because like when you're playing a tune, there's no going back. If you're performing or you're playing for yourself, your friends, there's no going back. That's why the metronome is so, so key to helping you understand and feel that pressure. Like you can't stop. There's no going back, right? All right, so I speed it up. Right? Now let's say I make a mistake. Let's say I make a mistake. And this happens so, so much. And let's say my mistake is here. Okay, so clearly I hit a wrong note here. And so many people do this. And it's just, it's so hard. And I understand this is why step number one, you got to come with a disciplined mindset. You can't go back to the beginning. <laughs> okay? You, let me repeat this. You cannot go back to the beginning of the phrase. Again, let's say your lick was this. Let's say you're practicing a line. Right? Let's say you're practicing that. If you make a mistake somewhere in the middle of your practice, right? You can't go back to the beginning. You can't go, oh, let me try it again. Uh oh, okay, I got it this time. Let me try it again. Oh, shoot. Nah, nah. Now you're making mistakes all over the place and in other areas, right? And guess what? Like I said before, guess what's happening when you're playing these mistakes? Your body, your mind, your hand is learning these mistakes. Your hand, your body, your mind is learning every single time you play something. I can't stress that enough. So what you need to do is you need to isolate the problem within probably three, maybe four notes, right? So if my lick is this, so this right here, so I'm gonna shorten and isolate my mistake to the closest possible thing I can practice, which is gonna be this. Now I'm using a thumb switch, which isn't, which isn't the best fingering. You should probably do this. Okay, and I'm gonna practice that a good five to 10 times because I just made a mistake. I need to relearn that part. And that's what's, what I'm gonna do from there is start to back it up, right? And then I have this. And again, like if you're reading this, so I'd come off this A and then I'd come from the C 
right? And then I just keep backing it up until I've moved back to the beginning. I think I'm changing the line as I'm demonstrating, but that's okay. You get the picture, right? But what you cannot do is you cannot keep going back to the top of the piece. Like so many students make mistakes in the middle of the tune and then they go all the way back to the top, right? All the way back. You cannot do this. This is not helping you learn. And it's wasting hours and hours and years of your life and your progress. Please, please do not do this, okay? So this is the learning process. So now we're upping the tempo. We're using a metronome. I have, a, I have the tempo, you know, and it's going. Or let, let's use this other lick here too. That's, I mean, it doesn't matter what you're learning. And again, this is the same for chords, everyone. If you're practicing your drop twos... Let's say you're practicing this, or you're practicing with extensions. Right, if you make a mistake in there, well, I just made a mistake. <laughs> so I didn't put the flat nine there, so I put a, 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 a natural nine. So I'm not going to go back to the beginning, I'm gonna play the chord a couple times. Before I start over again, I'm gonna play that chord to make sure I know what it is. Okay, I'm teaching my body to play this chord. Okay, and then I'm, I'm again, I'm going to turn the metronome off. I'm going to relearn the whole process. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, I'm still teaching myself again. I'm unlearning the mistake I just played. Because again, my body learned the mistake. I need to relearn the correct way slowly. Okay, I'm going to add my metronome back in. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. And then I'm going to up my metronome. And then I've, I've put that together. Okay, so that's step number four. I'm going to wrap up here. Step number five is going to be integration, integration. So step number four was the learning process, right? And how to practice the exercise that we've set for ourselves in step number three. Step number three was what to practice. We're picking our exercises, right? Step number four is the actual process, the learning process that you need to implement with your discipline, okay, to make sure you're learning in the correct way to practice the exercise. Now, step number five, we've practiced our tool, right? And it's time to integrate it into a tune. How do we do that? Whether it's an improv line, a chord, anything. Right? The first thing you're going to want to do, let's say you've just learned your drop twos. Let's stick with these drop twos. Okay, the first thing you're going to want to do is play through the tune slowly and simply integrate whatever it is you've practiced without any pressure. No metronome, no melody, no anything. Right? And again, this is a comping tool. My focus here is a comping. Or like if I'm playing a melody, maybe I'm comping for myself, right? But this is kind of more of a comping tool. You know, there's other things too that can happen. So I, I would move through my tune and I'm just playing my drop twos. And then maybe it goes to my uh, two, five and F. And then back to D again. So I'm simply moving through my tune, playing the new tool that I've just practiced. Now, the integration part should only be like five to 10 minutes. It really shouldn't take that long, right? So now I've integrated these. And again, any if you do make a mistake though, right? You wanna go back, you wanna revert, you wanna stop and ensure that you don't make more mistakes. Ju practice correctly the second time, like immediately right after you make the mistake. Oh, I mistake. I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to play the right thing next so that my body is learning correctly. Right? Then finally, put the metronome on for your tune, whatever tune it is that you're working on at a slow tempo, right? and comp through the entire thing. And when you get to the spots where you're integrating this particular tool, right? In this case, it's your drop twos. 
you're gonna you're gonna be able to integrate those and play them naturally as they come out in the tune right and as you get more comfortable with the tool you'll be able to kind of add some different types of textures some more musicality but in the initial stages it's really just about integrating the tool into the tune getting used to it and again this shouldn't be the the bulk of your practice this should be easy now because we've done all the heavy lifting before this is just the in integration part right because we've done all the heavy lifting of all the different types of practicing methods the learning method this should come out pretty naturally at this point Whatever it is you're practicing. Now, this could be a lot of different things. You could be practicing chord progressions. You could be practicing voicings, the blues, styles, uh, any sort of theoretical concept, right? Th that would you would take on this process for this five-step process that I just taught, right? Let me go back through the steps before I wrap up. So, number one, discipline. Make sure you're you're in a disciplined state of mind before practicing something, okay? You can't show up and then start to play what you know already or kind of let your mind wander. That's not good practice habits, right? Just set five minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, right? Of practice time. And you're going to start to build the habit of good practice, like of, you know, good practice habits. And then you can start to increase that time. Your 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 mental focus is literally, it's, a, it's like... Um, it's learns. You learn toughness. You learn mental focus. You learn to elongate the duration of time where your mind can focus on practicing, right? So you start at 15 minutes. Okay, you did 15 minutes. You struggled. You're tired. I get it. And then, and then you do that for a week, then 20 minutes, then 30 minutes. Eventually, you get to an hour where you're loving the practice. You're loving the process of practicing. And because you're following this five-step process, you're actually making more improvement faster because you're learning the right way. Okay. Step number one, discipline. Step number two, goals and assessment. What are you trying to accomplish? Jazz piano is a cacophony of categories. You have solo piano, group piano, comping, voicings, um, you know, drop twos, uh, you know, rootless voicings. You have improv, modal improv, scales, modes. Like what is your goal, right? It needs to be specific. It can't just be, I want to learn how to play jazz piano. What style do you want to learn? I want to learn how to play solo piano. Okay, what type of piece do you want to learn how to play? I want to learn how to play medium swing tunes. Okay, great. What, you know, what medium swing tune do you want to learn? Okay, I want to learn um, night and day. You know, I said that as an example. Okay, let's look through night and day. Well, it's got these particular types of chords in it, right? Do you know all these chords? Well, no, I don't know. My minor seven flat five. Okay, great. That's a good starting point because you're obviously going to need to learn how to play minor seven flat five chords to play night and day, not to mention a whole other slew of jazz standards. Now let's say you do know all the chords and you can play through night and day, but you're playing rootless root position voicings. What's your next step to make things better? This is where the assessment comes in. Well, you need better voicings. You need better system and arrangements of your voicings in the solo piano category that you're working at. So goals and assessments is really important because it's going to direct and dictate all the other steps to come, right? Step number three, what do you practice? Now, unfortunately, this is a really tough one for a lot of people because, again, unless you're a jazz piano school member, you're not really going to have access to really strict curriculum set exercises that are going to help you get better. But you can kind of, again, assess for yourself and, you know, think about it. Well, if you don't know your minor seven flat five chords, it's a pretty good idea to practice them, right? And that's going to help you learn your tune. So what to practice? And again, I showed you my voicing techniques. Again, for improv lines, there's a whole other slew of things to work on your improv. I'm not going to get into that today. Step number four is going to be the learning process. The learning process. Practice things correctly the first time. Go beyond slow than you would think you would need to ensure that you're playing things correctly. And I guarantee you, the more you can play something correctly from the get-go, from the get-go, like from the very first time you place your hand on the piano, you're gonna drastically cut your practice, practice time in half. I get sheet music for large written jazz band piano lead sheets, and it's very overwhelming to even me, to me. 
And what I need to do is that when I'm learning uh, a score, you know, like I played Porgy and Bess a couple years back. I remember this very vividly because it was very overwhelming. Um, at SF Jazz. And my piano um, part for Porky and Bess, as you can imagine, it was dense. It wasn't just chords. Like I had lots of written areas to play Porgy and Bess with a full big band and two singers, Porgy and Bess, right? At SF Jazz in the main hall. (laughs) So I didn't have much time to learn this. So what I did, literally, my goal was obviously to learn the music, but the, the point for me was that I needed to focus so strictly and disciplined on making sure that I hit every single note as I was practicing the certain parts where I wasn't comping, right? You know, because in the, your jazz big band lead sheets, you have comping and then you have written parts at some, at some points. I had lots of written parts. When I was practicing that, because I didn't have much time to practice, I think I had like a week and a half maybe, I needed to practice so accurately and focus that I was ensuring that I wasn't hitting any wrong notes because I was teaching my hands, I was teaching my body, my mind to play the correct notes the first time so that I learned it the first time, the second time, the third time. Did I make mistakes? Obviously. Like you're going to make mistakes no matter what. But in those times you do make mistakes, again, you need to chunk it, isolate the problem. Don't go back to the beginning. Don't go back eight measures, 16 measures, 32 measures. Do not go back to the top. Go back one measure and tackle that issue. Play it 10 times right without any tempo so that you've relearned it and you've gotten rid of the mistake and then start to move your way back. Add on one measure backwards. Add on two measures backwards. Right? And if you make a mother mistake, go back to the, the, you come back to the same exact process over and over and over again. Okay. Step number five is integration. Integration. So after I was done kind of practicing through the entire, um, all the written parts, um, th- this is a kind of a different example, but obviously I needed to get it up to speed. So I slowly increased the metronome, got it up to speed. If you're working on any sort of tools that you're looking to in- interject, inject into tunes, right? You'll work the tools through the tunes. Let's say you're practicing your drop two. You work it through the blueprint. And then after you've played it without the metronome, slowly put on your metronome. Again, this process is not a long process because you've already done the majority of the work. You work that through. And then essentially it will start to bring the piece together, up your metronome tempo, start to add some inflections, some rhythm, some musicality, some textures, and eventually, and then your tune essentially will take on exactly what you've practiced. Okay. That's it guys. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Again, I know there's a lot of information there. I'd highly recommend you go back and listen to everything that I went through because it's a really, really great episode. Um, go to jazzpianoschool.com to check out all the free education we have. If you want to get on the live stream, podcast audience that I have right now about to do a Q&A with, go to jazzpianoschool.com forward slash live podcast, jazzpianoschool.com forward slash live podcast. Uh, with that being said, as always, have a fantastic day and happy practicing.